Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we are back to talking about one of my favorite authors of all time, Ernest Hemingway. If you haven't yet, please click that subscribe button. And now, let's jump right into it. By 1952, Ernest Hemingway had already published a number of novels and he had already worked his way into being one of the all-time great American authors. He had changed the way that prose operated, changed the way that you could design characters and, and the types of characters that people love to read about. But he had yet to produce his magnum opus. And even though Hemingway was sort of on the block to receiving a Pulitzer Prize or some other great literary award, he hadn't quite broken through with his masterpiece yet. That is, until he wrote The Old Man and the Sea, which is the book that we're going to be discussing today. The Old Man and the Sea is a very simple novel with simple characters. It deals with themes such as survival and grit and determination, but also the importance of community and intergenerational relationships. It's a phenomenal book in its simplicity. One of the great things about Hemingway is that he's never trying to trick his audience or take them for a ride. He is simply breaking down into the most simple ways things that we already know, things that we already want to connect with, and he's giving it to us in a package that we can that is readily accessible in a way that very few great authors before him did. So what makes The Old Man in the Sea so great? What makes it such a timeless story? And how come even, you know, close to 100 years after it was first published, how come it's still so great? Why, why is it still so beloved? The best way to find out is to dive into the text. As per usual, we do a close reading of text. We're going to focus on character, conflict, and environment. And we're going to talk about the construction of the story, why Hemingway made the decisions that he made, and how come, even though the story is so simply written and so easily accessible, it's one of those that you can go back to over and over again and still learn something. All right, so let's dive right into the first page. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. In the first 40 days, a boy had been with him. But after 40 days without a fish, the boy's parents had told him that the old man was now definitely, and finally, Saleo, which is the worst form of unlucky. And the boy had gone at, that order, at their orders in another boat, which caught three good fish the first week. It made the boy sad to see the old man come in each day with his skiff empty, and he always went down to help him carry either the coiled lines or the gaff and harpoon in the sail that was furrowed around the mast. The sail was patched with flower sacks and, furled, it looked like the flag of permanent defeat. Alright, so we've got a very unlucky old man who still has to work, and then a boy who really cares about him who helps him out when he needs to. So think about the positioning of this main character. The old man. So the old man is unlucky, but he's still working very hard. And as we come to learn about him, he does everything right. But, you know, the ocean is, is a, a fickle instrument of nature. It's, it's not a beast. It's something as vast and as incomprehensible as a planet or the moon. And it's something that the old man takes a lot of time to contemplate as he goes out into his boat and, and spends a lot of his time alone. So later on, the boy uh, tells the old man he'd be happy to come back into the boat with him. The old man says, no, you're having great luck. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine in a moment of, of sacrifice from the elderly to the young. You know, t he's telling the young boy, go on, I know you care about me, you know, have your own good life and, and I'm gonna continue doing what I'm doing. And yet the boy keeps going back to, to help the old man. It's a really nice moment of relationship building and character building where we can see uh, how much a young person cares about one of their elders. You know, not in a way where they have to, but in a way where they go out of their way to, to ensure that the elderly are being cared for. The old man was thin and gaunt with deep wrinkles in the back of his neck. The brown blotches of the benevolent skin cancer the sun brings from its reflection on the tropic seas were on his cheeks. The blotches ran well down the sides of his face and his hands had the deep creased scars from handling heavy fish on the cords. But none of these scars were fresh. They were as old as erosions in a fishless desert. Everything about him was old except his eyes, and they were the same color as the sea and were cheerful and undefeated. So we have this old man who's kind of being cared for by the boy who is still striving out into the ocean, doing what he loves, doing what he's done for his entire life. 
and the eyes tell us that he still believes he's going to be successful. So no matter how unlucky he gets, no matter how badly things are going for him, this is a character who doesn't give up. And because of that, he's the central character that we can root for. He's a guy that, that we all kind of recognize from our own lives, whether it's a struggling parent who's working hard to support the family, you know, a beloved cousin or uncle who's down on hard times but maintains a good attitude. We all know this character. Furthermore, this is a character that we see in ourselves a little bit. Everybody who's old enough to have strived to achieve something understands the feeling of, you know, feeling like you're not good enough or that you're getting unlucky or that things are just not working out in your favor. And yet those among us who inspire others are the ones who never give up. We keep that light in our eyes and, and we keep working hard to, to achieve what we think we, we can. And the old man is a representation of this nature that we have, the admirable nature in human beings, the indomitable human spirit, if you will. All right, now we're going to skip way ahead. And, and the reason I'm going to skip to this particular section is so that we can understand just how competent the old man is as he's in the middle of his uh, battle with the great Marlin. All right, so the old man is talking to himself. You better be fearless and confident yourself, old man, he said. You're holding him again, but you cannot get line. But soon he has to circle. The old man held him with his left hand and his shoulders now and stooped down and scooped up water in his right hand to get the crushed dolphin flesh off of his face. He was afraid that it might nauseate him and he would vomit and lose his strength. When his face was cleaned, he washed his right hand in the water over the side and then let it stay in the salt water while he watched the first light come before the sunrise. He's headed almost east, he thought. That means he is tired and going with the current. Soon he will have to circle. Then our true work begins. A little while later, he's thinking about how one of his hands is, is injured and, and you know he can't use it very well. Why was I not born with two good hands, he thought. Perhaps it was my fault in not training that one properly. But God knows he has had enough chances to learn. He did not do too badly in the night, though, and he has only cramped once. If he cramps again, let the line cut him off. The he in this case being the hand. So the old man talks to himself and he thinks about, uh, you know, the ocean and the boat and the different creatures in the ocean, but also in each of his limbs. And he sort of identifies each of his limbs that has to struggle separately from the others as its own object or as its own being. And it's a really fun moment of an older person identifying their own body parts that don't work as well as they used to, or, or some that work worse or better than others. I think it's something that, that can connect us with this old man, you know. Everybody's had the sensation where you squat down to pick something up and, and your knee kind of gives out on you or your back does. You think to yourself, wow, that never would have happened when I was 18, but it's starting to happen now. The other part of this passage that I really like is that we get to see how competent the old man is. The reason that he hasn't caught fish recently really is because he's been unlucky. It's not because he doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, he's thinking ahead as far as if his hand cramps, what he's going to have to do with the line in order not to lose the marlin. He's thinking about things like washing his face so he doesn't get nauseous because if he ends up throwing up, well, is he going to have the strength to reel in the marlin when it finally comes close to him? Later on, there are battles with the marlin and battles with sharks and, and a lot of other things. I won't give away everything that happens in this short little novel um, because it's very easy to read and, and I think it's best experienced, you know, firsthand by yourself. But as a primary reading experience, it doesn't really get much better than The Old Man in the Sea. One of the things that the old man contemplates in his small boat as he battles the marlin is the brotherhood that all earthly creatures share with each other. As he's struggling to bring in the marlin, you know, he thinks about how beautiful the fish is and, and how amazing it is that this fish, you know, strives for life and how powerful and sleek it is. He, he's in complete admiration of this animal, and yet he's battling it to the death. For him to survive, he has to kill this fish. But for the fish to survive, it has to get away from the old man's line. And this struggle doesn't bring, uh, you know, wrath or, or anger, and it doesn't ever get personal beyond the fact that, well, the old man has love for the fish. The old man feels that this fish is more his brother than any other creature that might exist out somewhere in the stars. Uh, 
and how beautiful it is that, that this fish lives and exists on the earth at the same time that the old man does. And he, he constantly refer, excuse me, refers to the fish as his brother on the earth. I think that this way of identifying the, the creatures on the earth, you know, outside of humans is really beautiful. And, and I think it's accurate. I think it gets at this feeling that humans have where we want to connect with living creatures, you know, other humans, of course, but also uh, just the creatures of the world. You know, think about how cool it is when you uh, whistle at a bird and it whistles back at you, that sort of thing. The main beauty of this novel to me is the absolute love that the old man has for his environment and for the other creatures of the earth, even though, you know, he's not really being treated fairly by the environment, as it were. He's got all the skills, he does all of the right things, and yet, you know, sometimes uh, you just get unlucky. And he never gets resentful at that fact. He simply strives to continue working hard, doing what he knows he should do, and, well, staying alive without any bitterness. The old man is somebody that we can all see and identify with and somebody that we can strive to be like, especially when we come on hard times. Something else I want to look about on this page in particular, but really throughout the whole novel, is the simplicity of Hemingway's language. There's never a time where Hemingway is trying to outsmart his reader or, or trying to go over our heads or say a simple thing in the most complex way he can. In fact, he's doing exactly the opposite. He's trying to say the most complex things that a person can think of in the simplest words possible. In short, he's trying to make his novel accessible to everybody who might come across and read it. Now, one of the reasons that Hemingway does this is because he was a newspaper reporter, and when you write articles for a newspaper, well, you wanna make sure that everybody who's reading the paper understands what it is you're writing. This simplicity in his language was something that Hemingway was criticized for often by other writers of the time. People called him a simpleton, and they called him uneducated, and they said he was too afraid to use big words. However, I think that Hemingway's decision to use simple words and to, to keep his sentences simple in describing really complex topics is ingenious. I think that he cements himself as one of the authors that everybody can read, you know, many, many decades after his death. There are some writers from that era that are really, you know, a terror to read, or, or they'll say concepts that we already know intuitively, but, but they just overcomplicate them into oblivion. I much prefer Hemingway's viewpoint as far as, you know, writing the sentences the way that he does. One final thing that I want to note is Hemingway's knowledge of his subject matter. He understands all of the different pieces of the boat and how and why they're used. He understands how a fisherman might think to themselves as they're uh, trying to battle a great fish over the course of days, how a fisherman might eat, the decisions he would have to make, even down to how he might have to switch hands with his line so as not to get cut. Because Hemingway knows his subject matter so extensively, he can choose exactly what the old man would have done in this situation in a way that's both believable and dramatic. He's not making decisions because he only knows a little bit about this topic. He's making the exact correct decisions based on what the person in this situation would do and what the reader might expect and want from the story. Anyways, there's a bunch more passages that we can get into. I'm curious, what's your favorite section of this book? I assume most people who watch this video have already read it. If you're writing a report for this book in school, well, hopefully this video helped you out. What book should we do next? Uh, what other passages should we talk about? Please let me know in the comments below. Whether you're new here or you've been here a couple times, you know that this is not the first and certainly will not be the last time that I fawn over a Hemingway novel. And remember, the best way to help a small channel like mine is to hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much, everybody. Make sure you get enough sleep and drink enough water, and I'll see you next time. Take care.